So I was interested, you said at the panel that um, most of the stuff that you composed for Pam and Tommy like, didn't get used. No, 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 no. A, a couple of the very initial oh, okay. ideas that I had. Oh, right, okay. Um, I, I presented and I was like, oh, I don't think that's exactly quite the character. And so we kind of like adjust things or start a couple things over. And then, and then once we're in the ballpark, then... Okay. Um, I imagine that happens a lot. When um, you're sometimes. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, I would say it's a big gray area. I would say sometimes you write a theme and it's like, oh, this is perfect, leave it. I want, we want the theme all over the place and sometimes it, it's not the case. Sometimes sometimes it's somewhere in there, you know, I love how it starts, but then I don't like the B section. So there's not really a solid answer to that question. Um, do you ever take those ideas that don't get used and repurpose them in another project? Um, well, has it happened? I'm sure it's happened. I think legally I'm not allowed to. Legally, oh, okay, legally anything. I write for a film, even if it's not used, is owned by the production company. But you know, you work with people enough, or you have you know uh, a shorthand with someone who's just like, uh, I don't like that. Don't want to hear it again. Use it for something else. And it's kind of casual permission too. I guess I don't know if I've actually done it. In the past, but possibly. Wink, wink. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you can tap to be closer for Young Jedi and congratulations on Thanks. What's your approach going to be to making the music familiar but very much your own? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I mean, entering into that world is really daunting. There's only a couple people that have been in that world. There's one in particular. Um, but, um, you know, I, I haven't started yet. I've written a couple themes that are very well liked. But as far as the general sound and the general world that we live in, as far as the sonic palette, and um, I haven't really seen any footage yet. I'm not actually supposed to get started on writing the first episode until a couple months from now. So we've been messing around with some, just some themes and some things to get me thinking, except I haven't really... I haven't really started writing like proper music for it yet, you know. As part of that research, might you listen to some of the Jack Eno's work or Hal's work? Uh, being in that universe, but obviously aren't John Williams. But not John Williams. Um, that's an interesting thought. Um, maybe, you know, I mean, you know, you also have to consider if they wanted the, the score to sound like solo or something, they probably would have given John a call, John Powell a call. Um, so, you know, I think it's. I think it's. Um, my approach might be, and again, I haven't really had that many conversations with production about this yet, but it's like, what what are the, like, when I was doing Kingsman, for example, um, we didn't want the music to sound like James Bond, but obviously the whole Kingsman franchise is, is, a, is a nod, is a respectful homage and a nod to the British espionage genre. So we were kind of like, what are those devices that we um, that we know and that remind us of that? But I didn't necessarily go back and like try to like rip off any any Lalo Schifrin scores or anything like this, or, you know. Um, but you know, maybe that will be the same thing where it's like listen to some, be influenced slightly by some of the symphonic work from Star Wars or even some of the kind of more contemporary stuff that Ludwig did. But I, I don't I don't really know yet. I haven't really put my brain in the in the driver's seat yet. You know, finishing some other stuff first. You know? <laughs> and see, building on that, I'm curious. I mean, obviously not seeing any finished product yet yeah. to compose. Do you at least get sketches or outlines of, hey, this is what the story's going to be, or, or do you um, literally have to go in cold in two months? When I first started demoing for the project, mm -hmm. um, we were basic. I was basically given like a pair, a paragraph of a synopsis of a portion of a scene, and it's like this is what might be happening. You know, try to try to build on it. You know, and but other than that, I mean, I haven't. Um, I really know nothing about the story. I know nothing. Um, yeah, it's it's tough to answer those questions because at this point, there, yeah, yeah, September in September, I think mid September, I have kind of my initial conversations to get started on it. It's so funny because I have a nephew who's back on the East Coast who is. Um, who is a huge Star Wars fan. I mean, knows all of the expanded universes and watched all the shows, read all the graphic novels and everything. And I'm calling, and he like knows more about the show than I do at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to, to see what it is. What I do know is that 
it's the first time they've um, dived into like material that is specifically for like three to five seven year olds you know so I imagine there's gonna be um, there's gonna be kind of a delicacy in the lessons that are taught and like the real kind of stripped down stripped down lessons that you would teach three year olds I would, I would, I would imagine at this point um, how hard is it to settle on the tone of a project how hard is it yeah um, I don't think it's that difficult. I think that a lot of the times, um, for, for me, it's, it's Dublin, because you could get so much from a script. You could read a script and be like, oh, I know, I could picture this is going to be like Drive, or I could picture it's going to be like, you know, some other shit, just to totally in the cut. But then once you see it, you, you could have been completely off basis, or, you know, like the script is also just a roadmap that they go into shooting with, and so a lot of the times there are detours, and they've got to take the detour, you know, so... You know, I, I like to also just, when you first, when I, the first time you watch the film, assuming we're talking about a film, it's the only time you get to watch it for the first time. So, that impression of like the color scheme, how fast is the edits, how grainy does it look, what, how do the blacks look on the screen, how sharp is everything, you know. Um, I think that is, I try to kind of like, go into it consciously knowing this is the first time and the only time I can watch it for the first time. So let's be really conscious of my um, my, my impression of how I'm feeling, you know, so that that definitely would influence total, totally what I do musically. Between Alice in Wonderland and Wild Wild Crocodile and the upcoming Young Jedi Adventures, you're doing a lot of projects that are family friendly. Yeah. Does that assist your creative process when projects that are targeting a certain general age demographic kind of have a quick succession? Um, it's a really interesting question, and it's something that I'm emotionally very aware of right now because my world pre COVID was very much. Um, G.I. Joe and Kingsman and pirates and doing these things that are like high octane action, adult, visceral um, music for these types of films. And then COVID happened. And I moved my studio home because of the obvious reasons. And I, and I knocked on my garage and built a studio there to write out of instead of the place that I, the studio that I was going into every day for the past 15 years. And this odd thing happened where all of the, and I did, it wasn't something that we purposefully did, but these calls started coming in for more kid-friendly, family-friendly, and I started demoing for these things that started getting them. And it was this shift that wasn't, like I said, wasn't intentional. And I have to say that um, it's a whole different world for me, because it's not necessarily, I mean, a lot of the times with these kind of adult action films, the, the music is like, it's how, how cool is it, how visceral is it. It's almost like making a record where a lot of the stuff is, is right at the front of the speaker, and it's, it's very ag aggressive and abrasive. And you need to be cool, and you need to like how how much how much more aggressive can it be, you know? And with these kids' films, it's all about just like melody and tune and working up the harmonies, and it's a whole different world for me. And I have to say that I couldn't be enjoying it more. I absolutely love it. It's making me um, really enjoy. And maybe the pendulum will swing the other way, and I'll get absolutely tired of it. But uh, you know, working working with Alice and especially working with Lyle which is just such a beloved um, and I didn't know this going into it just such a beloved children's book um, and then once I started doing the research it's like oh this, there's a whole series of these things like really held preciously amongst parents and children um, it's made me a better person like it's absolutely made me a better father a better husband a better person I'm like happier like going in to work every day like working with these tunes and not watching bullets flying and heads being heads rolling every day you know uh, I don't know if that was the initial question we, we had asked, but um, yeah, it, and it is totally different. It's me working, you know, especially with Alice, it's very traditional sonically. I'm working with, um, you know, the Western Orchestra, so I'm not reinventing the wheel sonically. I'm not working with like synthesizers and trying to recreate drum beats, and, and but, um, but it's more just about, you know, very simple tunes and how I can ma manipulate them to get these emotions across to, again, to a three year old, which is, which is uh, it's exor an exercise in itself. You mentioned Lyle. Uh, what sounds and instruments do you lean on to bring that character to Lyle was a Lyle was interesting. I'm just finishing up Lyle. I'm not, I, have, I have probably about less than 10 minutes left to write. I record an orchestra in like three or four, three or four weeks. Um, and it was a tricky balancing act because it's a musical. There are a number of songs, I don't know, six, eight songs, written by Pasek Paul, Pasek Paul, great songs, but
but they they have to be the lead singer of the band. They have to be the lead singer of the musical. They should be. The songs, I mean, are so musically speaking for the underscore. Um, it was it was a little bit of a lesson for me in. Um, in restraining myself not to go too overboard with the orchestration, with the even though Lyle is animated, it's not very flourishy. It's every time I kind of went, on, I had to figure out where the threshold was for the filmmakers and how much I could say musically and how showy we could be, because it's like, oh no, hold on, we've got a huge song coming up in six minutes, and we don't want to. That needs to be the the, the, the showcase, you know. Um, and also, you've got this, it, it's, it's so profound watching the animatics of the crocodile that I'm writing to, and then when we get visual effects updates and you see, okay, now it's colored, okay, oh, now they've done the shadowing and the texturing, and once, once they do the eyes, which is where you would just get the emotion from, um, I have to do less. You know, we may have a sad moment of Lyle on the screen, which I've like tried to really pull heartstrings. But once his eyes are fully rendered, it's like, oh no, 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 no! With the music, with the eyes in motion, it's now too much. So, 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 it's my job then to kind of sand it, sand my music down and figure out what the balance is, so we're not spoon feeding the audience too much. You know, you don't want to be because then it just gets a bit saccharine. You know, it just gets a bit cheesy then. So it's just that, um, and it's an interesting process doing it with. Like, like I said, with the with the updates and the, and the, the course of the process of first, I just get sketches of the. It's well, for, first of all, actually, it's an actor with an alligator face on, like mask, you know. Um, and then as they slowly swap these out, it's it's fascinating, you know. And it just proves to me about I'm just one cog in this greater wheel of making something like this happen, you know. So I'm curious about the creative process in terms of you. Go, you, you mentioned that you go in your studio to work naturally, but. I've always been fascinated, like, what happens, like, you say you're out to dinner, you're at a mall at a movie, does stuff just come to you and you're like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what, what do I do, or how does that happen? If you were to go through, and I will never let anyone see this because it's something I hold very close to me, but right. if you were to go into my voice recorder on my phone, mm -hmm. there's probably a couple dozen hours of... <laughs> 30 second clips of me going, oh, this could be for Lyle Disappointment. And I go, and it goes something like this, and the brass goes, and, it's, it, and I can't sing, so it's just, it would it's, be embarrassing to listen to. But yeah, that that's a huge lifesaver for me because I pop out of the shower when my bath, my phone is on the counter and sing something into it for 10 seconds to put it down. And a third of them I'll go back to because I'll remember that I had thought of something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then, um, you know, as far as being creative, creatively stuck, I think with television, because I really haven't done that much television in the past until the Disney shows. I did a show called Wrecked a, Wrecked a couple years ago, which was a mm -hmm. TBS comedy, which was hilarious. Um, but it's a different um, workflow than films, from, from my experience at least. Like, um, you know, for films, you have one chance to do a scene. And once you've done, once you're on episode 18 of Alice, you're like, I've done this scene 17 other times. Not just, but, it, but it's television, so it's very formulaic. And so it's a different skill set. It's like, well, now how can I, how can I do this a different way? How can I reorchestrate this? Or how can I manipulate the theme in a different way? Which is, which is fun. Um, whereas with a film, it's like, I've got one way. What if I have two different thoughts? Should I take two days to execute both of those thoughts or should I just run with one? But, um, and with TV, of course, it's just relentless, man. It's, for Alice, it's 22 minutes of music every two weeks, and there's just no if, ends, or buts. You just kind of have to, like, not second guess yourself and just get it out. You know, luckily, if you feel, oh, what if I want to give the next episode to kind of try that trope because, of, because it's very popular. I have a kind of random question. Is there an instrument that you've wanted to put in a score that you haven't been able to, that you, like, like a rant, like, I don't know, the didgeridoo or something? Um, I put in, I put in a couple, I always thought it would be fun to put kazoos in. And I put in some kazoos in um, in Alice. Uh, they've they've kind of become our. And at first, it was for there's there was one moment in I think one of the first episodes or the second episodes which um, was like a ta-da moment. And literally, the music goes. Bum -bum. 
and at first I, I did that with just kazoos, and they were like, it's a bit kazooey. Um, and so I think I actually just doubled it with brass, with some trumpets, so it would just not make it sound as a mix of it. So there's kazoos. Um, you know, uh, as far as other weird instruments, um, I don't know if anything specifically coming to mind. Um, I think it's always fun to kind of, um, you know, like just sonic drones or pads or synth kind of like ambiences. I always find, because anyone can kind of go out and buy a library and pull down a key and it goes, yow, or that, and it makes sense. I always find it kind of cool to, um, take other things like a car horn or something and you know stretch it out to be five minutes long so it no longer sounds like that. you know that's always fun for me as far as like experimenting with things that are not necessarily western orchestra you know take a knock on the table and put that through a 20 minute reverb so now all of a sudden I've got this ambience which is no one else has that in the world but me because I really like a lot you know um, yeah, I don't know about other instruments. Kazoos, I'll go with kazoos. Okay. You mentioned earlier how with La La Crocodile, you know, passing the colors of the singers, yeah. sometimes having to rein yourself in. How does this experience compare to Rocket Man? Um, Rocket Man, I feel like. So with Rocket Man, first of all, there was, there was a lot more songs in Rocket Man. So the fellow who produced the uh, all the songs for Rocket Man was Giles Martin, um, son of George, son of the George Martin, and uh, I worked very closely with him because almost for every song in Rocket Man, we go from a scene with score, and then all of a sudden they start singing, and then it goes back into score now, and so. What we found at first was that a lot of the times my score would be going on and then when the song starts it was almost like someone hit play on a CD player and it's like, here's the song. So we really had to work on cross-pollinating my cues musically to go into the intros of his songs and then out of the outros back into my cues where I would say, hey Giles, give, can you give me the stems for yours? And I would start muting and putting some stuff and replacing and then I'd give it back to him and then he'd take mine and start. So we kind of became this homogenous, you know,